these with roots in acoustical uh, signal processing yes. so on and so forth, and Craig knows this much better than I do, but cool tidbit if you get nothing out of this talk is that they, uh, they did work in uh, analyzing the JFK assassination tapes. Right. So, you know, that's a fun little uh, tidbit. The most famous, however, for work on the, uh, the ARPANET, and in particular, they were uh, one of the first contractors that did work in developing the first IP protocol routers, the internet message, the IMPs, the internet message uh, processors. Right. Um, they also uh, began as fans for the use of the at symbol. Uh, they invented that for email. And also, uh, Craig and others were instrumental in some of the developmental work that was done on TCP over the years. And uh, as Craig mentioned, BBM uh, at one point was an internet service provider. So any of my students who were in the class, if we, we talked about autonomous system numbers and so forth, BBM, of course, was AS number one. Right. Um, so that's the, the trivia. Uh, today, BBM still does a lot of, of DARPA uh, and government work. Um, so at BBM, Craig heads uh, the internet research department. Right. Um, I first ran across, you don't even know this, I first ran across your name uh, back in the late uh, 90s. And uh, I, I came across uh, Craig's name because they, BBN and Craig wrote a paper called the uh, 50 gigabit per second router. And um, this actually changed everything for folks like me at the time. And I think looking back on it, it's amazing how, uh, how instrumental this paper was. Because at the time, people were saying, oh, you can't do you know, line rate forwarding in a router uh, for variable length packets, right? You just can't do it. So people were coming up with schemes like ATM and all sorts right. of stuff like that. And, and Craig and others did work at BBM that's really instrumental in sort of the guts that are in modern IP right. routers today, which is one of the coolest things, I think, of well, thank Craig's you. legacy. So Craig is a fellow of the ACM, the IEEE. He's chair of ACM SIGCOM. Well. He's on just about every uh, steering committee I've ever right. seen. And he chaired the National Research Council on how the internet functioned after 9-11. And uh, he's also a true Renaissance man. Uh -oh. um, actually has, and if you don't believe me, he's got a degree in medieval European history in right. addition to uh, a PhD in computer science. Um, and today, uh, Craig spends a lot of time thinking about the physical layer. Um, in particular, he thinks about things like software-defined radio, cognitive radio, spectrum sensing, MIMO, uh, so on and so forth. And I think that's what he's going to talk about today. All right. Well, thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Uh, I what Bob didn't tell you is since he's been a graduate student, he's been hassling me to, to work with him on various things. And we've occasionally got to do it and had great fun. And uh, uh, this is paper, by the way, this is paper we're trying to place. <laughs> we're trying to get advice. Um, anyway, so uh, Rob asked me here to today to talk about the future of wireless data communications. Um, so this talk is uh, it, as much an editorial talk as a technical talk. So I'll talk about technology, but I'm really interested in not just talking about technology and, and, and where it might go, but I'm also deeply interested in actually making sure we do the research to, to make that technology go as far as it possibly can. Okay. Uh, it's, I was having an interesting talk with Peter Denning about innovation. One of my views about innovation is that uh, you know, creating a great idea is only great fun if you also find ways to make it matter. And so this, this discussion is in part trying to make technology matter. Um, in this case, most of the technology I'm talking about is not mine. It's not my invention. It's other inventions of others. But I want to, I think we have a great policy opportunity, one that matters for the military, one that matters for the consumer market. And I want to talk about it for a bit. So if you're talking about wireless data communications, um, the key uh, thing to note is that we have two very important trends in wireless going on at the same time right now. The first one is that wireless is rapidly becoming our primary access technology. Okay, it is the way that, particularly in the consumer market, but also in the military community, it is the way that people at the edges of the network get their data. Now, in the military context, I know that you know, also wireless is essential for backbone links, but both military and consumer world, wireless is becoming the way you get your data to the individual through your smartphone, through your through whatever you know your Wi-Fi device on or WiMAX device on your laptop. That's the way we're doing it. And the reason we're doing it is because increasingly our computing is becoming portable, right? I mean, it is, you know, I, I think I do probably two thirds of the Google searches, my Google searches these days on my phone, right? Because I'm out in the world and I'm saying, now where is the, you know, where do I find such and such in this town and so forth? If I, you know, want to find a Starbucks, I just press a button here and it tells me where the nearest Starbucks is. Okay, there are all these things that I can do. 
The other joy about wireless is it eliminates the need for actual physical wiring of your plant. And for people like me, I mean, BBN, our building um, has now been rewired, I think, at least four or five times for data communications. And it shows, okay? In fact, the fire marshal told us on the last rewiring we could no longer rewire in the walls because there was too much stuff in the walls. And so, in fact, in all of our floors in the older buildings, we now have racks hanging from the, the ceiling in which we can lay the wires and hopefully rip them out when we put in the next set. But the point is, that's very expensive. I ripped my house apart to put in Ethernet when I moved in, okay? I can tell you this is not cheap. You don't want to do it. Nobody does it anymore, right? They put a Wi-Fi hub in with the, at the point the cable comes in or the phone comes in. They don't bother to, to wire up the house. Um, so it's tremendously convenient in the consumer uh, community. It's essential if you're mobile in the military and in the consumer community. So wireless is becoming the way we connect. We're going to stop worrying about wire lines to most computing devices. Concurrently, we're in the middle of a revolution in the wireless technology itself. Okay? Um, in particular, we're reaching that very precarious moment, which happens periodically in various devices, in which we are shifting from a world in which the way that you interface with the world is done by hardware, and you have to build a special chipset to an IEEE standard, and manufacture it in bulk, and persuade everyone to adopt it. We're shifting to a world where all the external behavior is determined by software, and the so-called software-defined radios, okay? And what I want to talk about is the collision of those two trends. So let me just talk a little bit more about wireless's primary access because there's a key point here. I mean, I already made the point that it's already, you know, we're used to thinking of wi using Wi-Fi, iPhones, Androids, portable devices, all that good stuff. Uh, sensors as well matter. Uh, wireless sensing is actually a really great diagnostic tool, uh, particularly actually in one of the earliest cases in which it was used was in power plants for Navy ships because it turns out that going and inspecting the insides of the rotors and the engines, the, 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 the powertrain, is very, very difficult. It requires taking the ship down for a substantial period of time. It turned out to be easier to embed wireless sensors inside there and actually say, what tensions are you seeing? And ask the device to tell you how it's doing while running. Um, but the point is, we are, I think, pretty much all convinced that there's, you know, we're all using wireless as our access device. But there's this nasty problem. We're running out of spectrum, OK? There's actually a nice article in IEEE Spectrum magazine this month about this problem. Um, we can argue tremendously about exactly how much capacity is available in the spectral bands that are available to us, okay? But even if you take your most optimistic predictions about how much capacity we can squeeze out of the white space bands that we've just gotten back from the television folks, the various unlicensed bands, the various dedicated bands for the military for various consumer activities, there isn't enough spectrum. Okay, except in one place in the world, and that's Ireland. Okay, and I just mentioned this as a funny little note. If you want to do wireless research today, you really want to be in Ireland, okay? Um, because it turns out they sit on the edge of the European Union, and the European Union, as I understand it, has harmonized its spectrum maps in various ways to ensure that people didn't overlap and such like. And the, the consequence of Ireland being far off to the west edge by the water is they have large chunks of the spectrum that are, you know, in some sense had been reserved in some mode, but actually nobody cares if you use them. And so the Irish Ministry of Communications, as I understand it, has announced that it's all available for experimentation. So if you want Spectrum to play with, and you don't mind rain and Guinness, Ireland's the place to go, okay? Uh, I want to point out that if, if, if I was at a typical university, um, all the graduate students would immediately be clamoring to go because their view is Guinness is perfectly good thing to do and their work okay thank you um, so the the other piece of the technology you probably or may not have heard as much about I, I know a few of the audience have but let me talk about it the software defined radio so it's a highly programmable radio and what what has happened is we've gotten sufficiently good with DSP technology and FPGA technology that we can actually build a radio in which you can reprogram it literally in a matter of seconds. Now we're getting down to the matter of milliseconds um, to change how the bits are coded. We can change the frequency that you're using. We can ch you can program the media access layer, okay? So basically all the things from layer two on down in your networking stack, completely changeable at the drop of a hat, okay? Um, 
Now, the idea has been around since around 1990. Joe Matola was one of the pioneers in software-defined radios. Um, and if you're in the military, you say, yeah, well, hold it, JTRS has been around for a long time, and that's a software-defined radio. Yes, it is, but what has changed is that we're about to hit the tipping point where this isn't simply the matter of, of a government program where you spend $150,000 to buy a rack that's a programmable radio. We are very, very close to the point at which, in fact, software-defined radios are embedded in everyday devices. It is perfectly plausible to believe that within the next 10 years, maybe within the next six, this device will be using a software-defined radio inside, okay? Because the price is at this point dropping precipitously. Uh, indeed, some chipsets, I believe Atheros, is, or either Aptos or Atheros, now some, some of the Wi-Fi chipsets are now partially software-defined, okay? And that's going to increase. Um, the thing to remember about a software-defined radio is it's a chameleon. It can be any type of radio it needs to be at almost any moment. One moment it can be a cell phone radio running GSM. The next moment it can be doing Wi-Fi. The next moment it can be doing Bluetooth. Um, the next moment it can be running WiMAX. Uh, and it can do this as fast as it can load the software and, and install it and turn it around. Okay? It can, if it's all sitting there on its, in its storage, it just flips from one to the next, loads it in, and you're off and running. Okay? Uh, the other way to think of it in terms of its flexibility is that a graduate student hacking all night can change the protocols and give you a completely new set of protocols that you could not have envisioned the day before. All right? Uh, there are some people who believe it will be even better. You'll have a cognitive AI device that will actually reprogram it to a new radio protocol that it realizes it needs to run. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that today. That's a fun research topic, but it's not central. So I'm going to skip it. Um, so as I said, and I sort of keep leading myself to my slides, as I said, 15 years ago, 150K, all right? Um, now it's part of a printed circuit board, and in fact, I gave you three different examples of these technologies that are coming out that cost about $550 or less. Um, the, uh, the Winan radios, that's wireless network after next. That's a DARPA program. I think the radio is now in its third cycle. Um, it's, uh, you know... Nice small little radio. It's uh, been demonstrated in up sizes, I think, up to about 100 nodes at this point. Uh, works extremely well and costs about $500 per. Uh, USRP is, of course, the radio that goes with the GNU radio, that was designed to go with the GNU radio software package for experimentation. Uh, Sora, if I'm remembering correctly, because I put down three of the four radios. I believe that's the one Microsoft is about to put out for experimentation, their software-defined radio. Okay, as I said, some commercial chipsets already have software in them. Um, side note for those who were interested, uh, you wouldn't immediately think it, but in fact, fiber optic transmission is headed down the same path. Okay, Ips, uh, Infinera uh, already puts out a technology which includes basically software-defined fiber optic termination devices. Uh, so they're running into some of the same issues in the fiber optic space that we're dealing with in the RF spectrum space. Okay. Now, let me take those slides and just sort of state the changing world a little more dramatically, and then I'm going to talk about what I think are some of the key research issues ahead of us. Okay, so we're running out of spectrum. At a time that wireless has become the central way we communicate, we're running out of the spectrum the spectrum to actually support the capacity we need. And you know, you can read up on it anytime you want. It's in the newspaper almost every few weeks that somebody's screaming they don't have enough capacity, okay? We have a new type of radio technology capable of scampering across the spectrum using whatever parts of the unutilized spectrum is around, changing its behavior as it needs to, which could allow us to make better use of the spectrum, okay? Yet, from a research and public policy perspective, we're completely unprepared for this situation, okay? We have not done the research necessary to allow folks like the FCC, to allow the military to decide how to exploit software-defined radios to give them better spectrum capacity, okay? Um, and indeed, to make that point, I mentioned there was this nice article in IEEE Spectrum about we're running out of capacity in this month's issue. They don't mention software-defined radios in the entire article, okay? And I initially, I said, how could they forget to do that, right? It's so critical. But then I said, well, hold it. If I go back to my talk and I look at the points I make in the talk, 
there isn't enough information out there to allow them to decide if software-defined radios matter for their future choices. There are certain things we have to do. And so, in fact, as much as it annoys me, it made some sense. And my argument is we need to do certain key research. And what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is some of the critical open issues. And because just being hammered by critical open issues is sort of boring, I also added a couple little fun side topics at the very end just to talk about a few things that are sort of exciting and interesting and different. So before I launch into the long discussion, let me just give you an example of a software radio. I sort of briefly described it and waved my hands. Let me give you a picture. So uh, this is a pretty typical software-defined radio. Uh, this particular simple picture is to give you an idea of what one might call it the cost to, you know, $50 or so in 2020, approximately. Um, so the basic idea is you've got an antenna here over on the left, okay, and antenna technology, by the way, matters, you know, the range of RF spectrum you can pick up depends on your antenna technology. There continue to be improvements in antennas to allow you to pick up a broader range of the RF spectrum, um, but, you know, you're limited by your antenna, and there's some level of antenna control, which may involve directionality. Many of these newer antennas are actually multi-pole antennas so that you can do MIMO or directional work, and you have to decide which of the poles to turn on and what directionality you're trying to achieve. Attached, so that antenna control is, comp is controlled by that compute engine over there that tells the antenna what configuration it's in. Then there's a filter bank here. What's well, the filter bank? Um, it turns out, of course, typically you're only interested in looking at a certain portion of the RF spectrum at a time. You don't want to be doing a digital signal processing, an A to D conversion on the entire spectrum. You want to look at a piece. So what you do is you have these filters, analog filters, that chop out the particular band or bands that you are currently going to be looking at and using. Okay. Uh, this is, by the way, an area of extraordinarily fast improvement. Uh, you know, we've gone from uh, simple analog devices actually using micro machines, MEMS technology, to actually cut out particular bands, and we're moving towards digital technology very rapidly. The result of the spectral bands that you pull out, get on the inbound side, go to an A to D converter. On top, on the outbound side, you're obviously doing D to A to push it out to the antenna. Um, the A to D converter brings in, you know, snapshots, uh, typically 16-bit wide samples of your uh, frequency space, and that's fed into a compute engine. Now, you say compute engine. Well, you know, what is this? Is it a standard, you know, processor, embedded processor? No, it typically is not. Um, there's a lot of ferment in how these things are built, too. Um, a couple of years ago, I would have cheerfully just put the word DSP in there. Okay, because that was the way people did things. Now, in fact, a lot of people are moving to FPGAs. They're now easily reprogrammable FPGAs, and it turns out that they give you far more uh, effective processing power for the same footprint as a DSP for this purpose. So a lot of people are shifting to that. Some people are using mixtures of a DS, less powerful DSP with it teamed up with an FPGA. Some people are also sometimes teaming it up with a little bit of specialized hardware, particularly if you're doing multi-in, multi-out MIMO. Okay? Uh, it turns out that that's extremely hard to do except at high speeds, except in hardware, and so there's often a little MIMO chip that people are trying to put in these things. That will all evolve. Okay? DSPs do not get as fast as Moore's Law leads us to go fast and other processing technology, but they're still improving at a pretty good clip we will find that the particular compute mix in there will evolve. But this compute engine basically takes the digital samples, converts them to an individual bitstream, and then starts processing the bitstream, extracts the, the media access layer, the packets, all those sorts of things. It also has to be, in some sense, a real-time engine. Uh, certain protocols, for example, Wi-Fi, have in very tight timing requirements about how fast you have to respond to certain packets. So this is a very tightly bound together little parallel engine going there. But, perfectly plausible thing to see at 50 for a $50 radio. Indeed, uh, about a third of this is available now for five bucks as part of a Wi-Fi chipset. So it's not crazy that this will be a $50 chipset in 2020 or actually even $50 retail, okay? A um, few other details I said. One of the interesting questions, of course, is the filter bank is how, what size chunk of the spectrum it can chunk cut out for you at any given time, and you know, they can, they can range in size from 100 kilohertz bands to megahertz bands, all right? This is the kind of thing that's our future for the consumer market. 
Um, and as I say, it's because, uh, you know, some of these kinds of things are already being built at, at plausible price ranges, to, and if you do the trajectory, it all works. Um, so now let's talk about the impediments to progress, and I'm going to talk about three core problems. The first one is programming your radio, okay? Now, um, this, is a, this is a weird one because you say, well, these people were innovating in software-defined radios. They've got to be programming their radios already, and that's right. They are. Um, but they, they're doing it in a way that actually doesn't exploit the radio very much. Um, the other problem is that they're doing it in a way that isn't very scalable. Um, let me focus on the scalability and then I'll talk about exploiting the radio. The current model is that what you do is you either take a, a graduate, a person with a graduate degree in computer science, and you spend three years teaching them RF physics, and then they're allowed to program your software to find radio. Or you take an RF physicist, and you take three years and teach him or her how to program, and they work on your software to find radio. Okay? This does not lead to a large population of people who can program software to find radios. Um, so that's the scalability of the programming model problem. Um, and, and they're doing this all as embedded programming. They, they tend to really throw out the operating system. They throw out you know, any structured programming that you ever learned in your life. And they're just sort of programming the equivalent of DSP and, and FPGA assembler to make the radio work. Okay. Um, and they're doing it each on their own specific radio platform. And the problem is that beyond the scalability of finding enough programming staff, there's the problem of compatibility, right? You have a software-defined radio. I have a software-defined radio. They're from different manufacturers, but we'd like to have them communicate, right? That's the whole point of this game is digital communication. It, you know, it doesn't really work if the two radios can't talk to each other. I mean, you know, um, I confess the cellular industry has tried to convince us that, only, that, that all you need is a device that can talk to their network and nothing else. But for all other data communications purposes, the point is that any device would like to be able to talk to any other. Um, and how do you make that work in a world of diversified software radios, right? And, and let me make that concrete. Okay, to, to carry this example for the next few slides. You just landed in a foreign country. I picked Tokyo as just one useful example where you're likely to find a fair bit of innovation. You, you're carrying a PDA or a phone. How does the operating system on your PDA discover and run the right communications protocols for your device to operate in Japan? And by the way, if you don't know right now, if you land in Japan, with you know, many phones, you'll discover they don't work because the Japanese have a completely different set of cellular formats that they use. Uh, and it used to be sometimes you have trouble with Wi-Fi because they had different preferences about which Wi-Fi bands to use. Okay? So you land there and you say, well, you know, what am I supposed to do? All right, so, um, so the, the answer is we don't know. But let me, let me sketch out the broad range of solutions. Um, the simplest assumption to make is that there's a radio channel running in the airport. Okay, well-known radio channel, standardized worldwide. If you don't like that notion, say, okay, there are five, five standard channels, and every country picks which one of the five they use. And where you're standing, you know, in any public place, you know, it's just blasting out information about the local communications protocol. So you can listen to that channel and figure out what you're going to do. Okay. Okay, well, that's a great idea, but exactly what is that radio channel telling your PDA? Okay. So far, I've been able to, to find three approaches, three different things that might be transmitting on that channel. Um, and I'm going to describe each one in a separate slide, but let me just say high order. One is tags, which is to say these are well-known identifiers, okay? And it's just telling you run Wi-Fi or run, you know, CDMA or whatever, okay? Another one is it's actually sending out software by vendor. So each vendor is broadcasting their own stuff. Another one is it's sending out software per protocol that works on any device. And let me just talk about each one of those in a little bit of detail. So tags. Here you go. Your PDA, you turn on your PDA when you landed, and what's going on that channel is just a list of identifiers, okay? And, you know, assume IEEE or somebody else puts out an annual list of radio configuration names, and each name is sufficient to tell the, the PDA exactly what software it should be running, okay? So, um, there's a funny little problem here, which is if your PDA actually already has that software on it, you're golden. If it doesn't have that software on it, now you've got to find some way to get that software, 
Yeah, maybe you run off to a software store in the airport. In Tokyo, that's perfectly plausible, and you buy it, okay? Um, you know, you, you maybe have to go to your hotel, find an actual wired connection, plug your laptop in, download it from the vendor site, pay for it presumably, and then load it into your PDA. Many different choices, but there is this problem of how do you get that software? You're not really, this doesn't really solve the problem of getting your PDA up and running. It just tells your PDA what it doesn't know. Okay, so it tells the PDA, uh, you should know this to work here, and if you don't, <coughs> go find the answer. Um, I do want to point out that this is probably the most secure, uh, sorry, uh, mature solution currently that exists that anybody's played with. Because it's basically what JTRS does. JTRS approves a set of what it calls waveforms, which basically specify all of these issues. And so when you know what waveform you're running in a particular area, it can give you the name and you know whether your radio does that waveform or not, okay? I want to point out, though, that that's, that's a limiting solution, too. I mean, JTRS originally envisioned that they would have dozens upon dozens of waveforms. In fact, they're working to try to standardize on a list of, I'm going to get the number not quite right, but the latest time I looked on the website is about half a dozen or so, okay? You know, allowing a huge number, hundreds or thousands of waveforms is not really what TAGS is very good for. Um, another choice is that the channel is actually broadcasting, you know, the binary of the software that you're supposed to run in your PDA, okay? And I'm going to assume it's digitally signed. Of course, there's no promise it has to be, but let's, you know, assume your vendor digitally signs the software. And so your PDA turns on the channel and sits there listening, and, you know, voila, eventually it hears something that says, okay, if you've, you know, got a iPhone 3GS, this is the software you should run locally, and it downloads it and installs it, and you're off and running, okay? Um, this works. Works perfectly well, um, but it doesn't scale terribly well because it means that every possible distributed device, every possible device that might be used for every vendor you, and every version, you've got to be sending out the software. So you could be standing in the airport for an hour waiting for your PDA to hear its particular software package. Um, it's also, from a commercial perspective, terrible because the potential to cut out new entrants is high. Um, remember. Airports are already under fire for trying to restrict, you know, who can use you know, their airwaves and how. You can imagine that they would charge vendors for the right to, you know, distribute their software releases on this channel. And so if you buy your phone from the wrong vendor who hasn't paid the local airport authority the money, you'll discover that your software never shows up over that channel, okay? Uh, so it's not a terribly pleasing approach. Um, so I've just pointed out tags has this limit on how many tags you can have and the fact it doesn't seem, you, have, you still have this out of, band, out of band problem of getting the right software and that individual vendor software doesn't scale. Well, this raises the question of is there a better answer? And the answer is maybe. And the idea here is that instead of sending out software for every vendor, um, what I do is I send out software for each protocol, software that any radio can run. And when I say this, a certain number of the software radio guys go, huh? And then I say, well, okay, we, we've done this in the networking world before. There's this thing called Java, right? It runs on every platform. And they immediately say, well, but I don't want to run Java, you know, for my radio protocols. I say, you don't need to run Java for the radio protocols. All I'm saying is Java is an existence proof that you can write a language that will run on any platform. And so now the question is, could you create a language that will run on any radio platform? Okay, now it may, it may be that once you compile it up on your platform, you download it to your platform, your platform says, well, this, this requires processing capabilities I don't have. That's okay. You can say, sorry, you're running too old a phone to be operating in Japan or whatever. But if your phone has the right capabilities, it should say, yep, and start running the protocol. Um, it's a tricky problem. Remember I talked earlier about the fact that Compute Engine may be an FPGA, it may be a DSP, it may be a mix of them. Of course, they may be from different manufacturers. So finding a universal software coding that can map into the underlying binary code that the individual radios want is not easy. Um, but there is a little bit of work in this area, and particularly some people have been working on very formal languages, which are almost specification languages. And if you imagine that the radio has ways to convert different parts of the specification language into individual bits in the FPGA and in the DSP, you might be able to pull it off. It's certainly by far the most flexible solution if we can achieve it. And the problem is almost no work has been done in this area. Okay. 
So, so here is one of the cases of not being prepared for the future. We clearly need to understand, you know, do tags scale? Is JTRS really telling us tags don't scale? Or is there, are there ways to make tags scale? Are there, uh, you know, is there a way to do a sort of universal software language for software-defined radios? Research needs to be done that isn't being done. And if it isn't done, we won't be able to exploit software radios the way we'd like. OK. A second issue. Um, it's an article of faith in the software-defined radio community that we can use software-defined radios to help in spectrum utilization, OK? And just to give you a sense of how awful the situation is, um, spectrum utilization in this country, and we're probably the biggest users of the spectrum, is pitiful, OK? In the most active area of the United States, so far as we know, which happens to be downtown Manhattan, if you turn on a spectrum analyzer and start looking at the use of the spectrum, you will discover that a whopping total of 13% of that spectrum is used. OK? Now, you can say, well, but you know, not all of RF is perfect for, for data communications. That's true. OK? And now, the temptation is to throw out anything that won't go through uh, a wall. But that's wrong. Remember, if you and I are both in the same room as the base station, we don't care about the question of whether the signals go through the wall. In fact, it's advantageous if they don't go through the wall. So there's a whole chunk of the spectrum that you can use, perhaps outdoors, perhaps indoors, and such that the software radio could adapt to. Um, the broad point is there's a lot of spectrum out there that we just ain't using. Okay? Um, if you go to rural areas, we're about 1% utilization of the spectrum. Other thing to remember is a lot of that spectrum that nobody's really interested in. It's you know the, the dying signal of a TV channel that you can't really, is no longer strong enough for anybody to use, but shows up in the power meter. Um, and if you go read the IEEE Spectrum um, article, uh, some of the users who are using the bands aren't using them very effectively. There's a lot of actual redundancy that you could get there with smart coding, orthogonal coding, to use that band without harming the incumbent user. So the assumption is software readers can help us fix this problem. They can use the unoccupied spectrum. They can use techniques to share the bands with the wasteful users who are using it, but not very well. That's the theory. Um, and you know, here's, your, here's an example. This is actually also from a part of New York, you know, which they're achieving 6% occupancy. Okay? There's a lot of emptiness in there. The assumption of software readers can, can help, but in fact, we know almost nothing about whether they really can. Um, in particular, um, nobody, and I'll, 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 there's an exemption, uh, there's a small uh, exception to that that I'll mention in a moment. Um, but nothing yet published gives us usage patterns over the day. These are, the tests that have been done have been sort of turn it on and, you know, for an hour or two and see how many bands have been hit and say that's the occupancy. Okay? Um, we don't have anything that tells, tells us the usage patterns, whether it's the same 13% that's used the entire day, or is that a shifting 13%. Um, we don't know how well the various sharing techniques that have been written up so beautifully in all the different articles about how you can share spectrum and do underlaying and so forth, we don't know how well they really work in the real world, okay? In a world in which channels are turning on and off at various times, there's this whole set of theories about how fast you have to exit from a, an emergency channel uh, context here, emergency channels for fire and police and so forth, um, they're almost always idle, OK? And so they're very tempting, because they're actually very robust radio channels. They're very tempting to use for software radios. But of course, you have to exit that channel as soon as a police car or a uh, fire truck happens in the, in the neighborhood and actually starts using that channel, OK? And so there's all literature about exiting from those channels and what, how much time you should take to exit and so forth. But nobody, so far as I can tell, has actually done a study in which they've actually gone out and rolled around and tested and seen whether if they do this, do they interfere with fire and police channels? And in the real world, how much access really is there? To, you know, how, much, how often those channels really idle and how often is a fire truck driving past and interfering with you? Um, Nobody has done these studies of how well these techniques right really work in the real world, OK? And the one exception is that there's a paper that's going to appear in two weeks at the Internet Measurement Conference where somebody has done a very careful study of just this question in a, very, a small set of bands and done a very, very nice job. And what they came up with is if you were trying to um, reuse the occupied bands, and only the occupied bands, you're trying to stay only in bands where you're sharing. There's no use of idle bands to help out. Um, they get about 37% of the, the, the available spectrum back, 
Okay? It's the first time we had a number, you know? And yet here we talk about software defined radios can transform our use of the spectrum, and we have no idea how they really how much they'd really transform it. I mean, if you're a policymaker, you'd say, well, how do you know? And it's all just paper studies, okay? Third problem. Um, incumbents. Um, a central piece of, of uh, spectrum regulation um, in the past uh, decade or so has been uh, you know, about, well, for, it's been true for nearly a century now that what we do is we assign portions of the spectrum to people for their exclusive use. We thought we had to do this to enable tele television and FM radio and AM radio and all that sort of stuff. Um, these are referred to in general as the incumbents. Um, there's a reluctance to refer to them as the owners, though they actually act as if they own that chunk of the spectrum. Um, furthermore, in the past 10 years, there's been an acceleration of this policy as governments have discovered they can actually auction off the rights to have some of that spectrum. And so they actually make billions of dollars from giving chunks of the spectrum to somebody. Um, and that's very popular in these days when people, governments don't want to raise taxes, they can instead sell off public assets in this way. Um, those incumbents, many of them now with multi-billion dollar investments, worry that software radios will trample on their rights to exclusive use. Okay, and so they're terrified that we'll have radios just swoop in and say, well, gee, you're not really using these cellular bands, so I'll just use them locally and that's okay. And their reaction is, ho, 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 we, 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 we paid for that, we should get something in the deal, okay? And just to give you a sense of how noxious this problem is, here's a current picture of the United States spectrum allocation map, and as you can see, I think the little white spaces are ones that are unassigned. Basically, anything that isn't white in the chart is, you know, somebody thinks they own it. Um, now, the rich set of solutions to this problem. The core idea is that you should only be able to use somebody's chunk of the spectrum if they've permitted you to do this. Um, sort of unsaid in that, but of course implied is that you actually bought the right from them. So you bought some digital chip that said, I'm allowed to make use of this chunk of the spectrum. Now, you may immediately, may immediately think, go back to that chart and all those different uses and say, I don't want to be negotiating with 500 different organizations to, to use their chunks of the spectrum. Well, you won't have to do that. You'll probably go through some consolidator who sells you a chip that allows you to use 100 different frequencies and so forth and so on and redistributes you know, a few cents or so or a few dollars to all the different spectrum chunks, that you know, spectrum owners, spectrum incumbents that, that you're, you might possibly use. So the idea is you've got permission to use the spectrum in some way. And so the question is, how do we make that work so the software-defined radio is a good doobie and only uses a chunk of the spectrum it's supposed to? So simplest here to say you're authorized to use some chunk of the spectrum, you've got a chit, and these are digitally signed certificates, okay? So objects can be signed. And you can view the FCC or your local spectrum regulator at the top of a digital hierarchy, and they sign for the spectrum incumbents and so forth. So solutions for sharing, um, I've been able to identify roughly four different paths. Um, one is that the Spectrum Authority distributes a list of acceptable configurations, okay? Um, so what happens is the FCC sends out a list and says, here are the different, uh, you know, ways that you can configure a radio to operate in these different frequency bands. So for each frequency band, there are a set of rules about how you can use it, and if you, Conform to those rules, and you have a signed chip from the spectrum incumbent for that band, boom, you can do whatever you want within those sets of rules. The rules are selected to ensure that, the, that you don't do anything that violates the incumbent's current operating practices, but it's produced by the FCC within a chip from the incumbent, boom, you're okay. Uh, that's really tempting, except the probability is that list is just too big to store in your typical radio. Not sure, but probable. Another choice is that in any given region, you know, like Monterey or maybe just on the NPS campus, there's a radio broadcasting what's permitted in that area. So what's what, what bands are available to you, how are you allowed to use them, assuming the incumbents have given you permission, okay? Um, that's probably what IEEE 1900 is trying to do. Um, Another possibility is that when you download that software from the configuration channel, it has attached to it a whole list of certificates from different spectrum operators or from cons spectrum consolidators 
that state what frequencies of software can be used on. Flip side is the chip has a list of different software versions that it permits, but it says here's what what frequencies you can use. The fourth one is is a cognitive radio that looks at the, that reads a list of acceptable configurations by the Spectrum Authority, combines that with the chits, and creates custom protocols for use. Okay, um, I'm mostly going to skip over the cognitive radio. It's a fascinating problem. Yes, you can do it, uh, but it's not the you know it's not the deep deep issue. The the interesting thing in front of us really is whether we're going to accept the IEEE 1900 approach or whether either some list of configuration rules or some form of software with attributes is the better approach. Right now we're headed right down this, this route without really, so far as I can tell, looking at any of the others. Okay. So I'm going to come back to this in a moment, but I promise that I take on a little bit of fun. So let me just talk about two other fun issues that come up in software radios. Um, the first one is energy uh, consumption. Um, and the, the couple points here, one is that uh, wireless is rapidly becoming the dominant consumer of the battery power in your devices. Okay. Uh, another thing that most people don't seem to know is that actually receiving is, consumes more energy than transmitting. Okay, all right, and that's a nuisance because, of course, most devices spend most of the time waiting to hear something, okay, and to discover that it's not sending to somebody else that's expensive, it's listening on the chance someone's going to talk to you uh, pre presents some challenges. Um, the, uh, the fundamental trick here, therefore, is to try to turn your radio off, and indeed, most energy conservation protocols are some technique for turning your radio off for periods of time to save energy. Uh, unfortunately, turning the radio back on again takes a little while for it to stabilize, um, and you have to turn it on fairly frequently if you're not going to cause huge delays for people in trying to reach you. Now, the nice thing to note is there's a fairly recent result in the past few years, um, and uh, I, I have some teeny tiny portion of that result. My, my name's on the paper. So this is the first place where you hit something I actually helped in, that has shown that we can actually devise radios that use 99% less energy and achieve roughly the same throughput and the same delay as existing data radios such as Wi-Fi. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm happy to explain the details and questions if anybody cares. Uh, what I want to think, well, you all to take away is the fact that um, just because radio is currently an energy hog doesn't mean it has to be in the future. And the other thing is that the sort of standard for improvement is two orders of magnitude, okay? That's where the research frontier is headed. There, there are a bunch of papers still coming out where people say, oh, I saved 10%. And the answer is no, no. 10% isn't the number you want. You, you, know, you want to be 90%, 99%, 99.9%. Um, I will say it's a point solution, okay? It was designed for sensor networks. It has the right results for sensor networks. It was also shown, we tripped on this accidentally, that it works very well for um, uh, environments where we have a fairly high, uh, uh, sensor networks are known for having a very low traffic volume, okay? We've shown that it actually can work in fairly high volume networks such as Wi-Fi networks as well. But intermediate volumes, distance, certain other properties, we haven't had time to look at them and I'm sure there may be other algorithms that might work better. Okay, in certain contexts. We, it's a point solution. There's plenty of research to be done there. Um, the other thing that I find interesting is um, if we make the radios energy efficient and they're highly flexible devices so we can use them just about anywhere in the world, um, we're going to have these long-lived radios that in fact become disposable. Now, you know, if, if you're using 99% less energy, it's perfectly plausible to imagine use one, you know, that you get pagers that are charged once. You get a charge once, you know, pager. We don't tend to have pagers anymore. We have PDAs, but you know, some of us still wear little beepers occasionally. Um, that just runs for a year, and when it stops working, you throw it out and you buy a new one. Okay, um, because that's simpler than than trying to put in a recharging service and so forth. And at 99 percent, a typical pager would run a year before you need it again. Um, Pagers, presumably, we'd know we were throwing them out. We wouldn't lose them. Sensor radios, on the other hand, 
in this world, you would be able to distribute a sensor radio and it would work for a year or two years um, before it died. Uh, two years from now, you may be far away from where that sensor is. You may no longer be even tracking that sensor, but it was too much of a nuisance to go find it because the sensor is some little you know, square thing that you just sprinkled in the area to do environmental model, you know, environmental sensing. If you're doing science, it may be that you used it in combat and you sprinkled it around, you know, in front of uh, your uh, fortification uh, and you've moved on and the sensor's still sitting there. Um, you, we probably don't want to be leaving around vast amounts of electronic trash in this form. Uh, particularly since a lot of that is uh, still made with chemicals that are rather dangerous to let degrade in the environment. Um, so how do we avoid that? It turns out there are people who are working on biodegradable software-defined sensor radios. They're working on radios that are designed to simply naturally decompose over the course of about two years in, in a way that in fact doesn't harm the environment they're in. This is the WiseNet project in Sweden. It's one, it, that's just one of the many things WiseNet's doing. WiseNet, so you know, is the leading sensor radio project uh, in the EU these days in terms of developing next generation sensor radios. Um, and another, you know, fair disclosure, I'm on the advisory board for WiseNet. Um, but uh, at any rate, so, um, so that was just a little excursion and some fun topics related to software radios just to sort of deepen the picture. I want to come back and focus for the next uh, five minutes or so, and I want to leave some time for questions on what we need to do um, in terms of making use of software-defined radios and informing spectrum regulators and indeed, you know, uh, folks in the military planning for the future. Um, we need experiments with real-world data that tell us how much software-defined radios can really help with spectrum policy. We haven't done those studies. As I say, one's coming out next in two weeks, end of this month. Broadly, we don't have any data. I can't go to the FCC and say, if you adopt software-defined radios, look, I've taken these pictures of the spectrum, you know, over a course of a week or so in New York, and I've run these algorithms against this usage, you know, this, this, this pat these patterns, these power patterns, and here's how much we'll get back with software-defined radios. Here's how much of the spectrum will become available. I can't say that. Nobody can. We don't know, all right? And so all this... The wonderful paper is about the opportunities of software-defined radios. We haven't done the fundamental testing that you have to do to say, yes, this will really work and this will really make a difference. It's still, to a large degree, fantasy and hope. Okay? We've got to wrap our head around what the right answer is for programming software-defined radios. Okay? Are we going to have to go with tags? Can we go with the universal programming language? There's a side issue. I'm just going to stick in here. There are a bunch of RF engineers who believe that, in fact, when all is said and done, there are only probably about a million different rational radio configurations, right? Where a radio configuration is sort of the cross product of the, of the spectrum uh, hopping approach that you decide to use and the different coding choices and the different media access, okay? And whether you use MIMO in one channel, two channels, four channels, whatever. Um, if that's true, it might actually be possible to replicate a software-defined radio with a chip that simply has about a million configurations in it, okay? And you can imagine as a set of registers, you load up the, re you load up the frequencies you're going to use for your spectrum hopping pattern, you turn on the particular coding you want, you turn on the particular MAC layer you want, you turn on all the various MAC options that you like, you know, what form of CSMA are you using, bang, 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 and voila, it works. Um, that would simplify the programming problem dramatically. It's probably worth building such a chipset, but nobody's funded an RF guy who believes in it to do it yet. Um, you know, the point is we haven't done the experimentation here to understand how to build inter inter interoperable software-defined radios in a consumer marketplace. Okay, and so again, uh, you know, we don't, if a policymaker, if we came to them and said software-defined radios would work, right now we'd have to say, yes, but you all have, you have to buy them all from one company, okay? Uh, one, there's going to be one chip man, ch chipset manufacturer, one software-defined radio manufacturer in the United States, and the answer is going to be, of course, that the European Union and, uh, and parts of Asia will pick a different one, and so we'll have the same sort of fights of you know, Qualcomm chipsets versus Nokia chipsets and all that sort of stuff, and we still won't have the interoperability we want. And, and, and that's not a particularly tempting world, yet we don't have an answer but that right now. Um, 
uh, this, we haven't done, I left a, a bullet out, we haven't done uh, a test of the different ways to protect incumbents. I can give you four different choices. I can give you a completely plausible argument about why any one of them might protect the incumbents enough that they should allow us to start reclaiming their spectrum when it's unused, but no one's actually tried a little field test to prove one of those schemes works. Uh, or better yet, prove that multiple ones work and we can choose the best one. So if you're a policymaker, um, you don't really know what software-defined radios can do for you. And so there's this great technology that's showing up. It is going to be part of our world because manufacturers benefit from software in their radios that allows them to tweak about bugs and change things. But if we're going to really exploit it for spectrum purposes and for maximizing our future, these are the things we have to do to allow the spectrum management world to actually say, yep, that's the right choice. And right now we're not doing them. So this is to some degree a call to arms, an opportunity for research, a suggestion about what problems one might take on. Um, and with that, I'm done with the talk. I've got about seven minutes left. I'm happy to take any and all questions that anybody might have. There are no wrong questions here, folks. Yes, sir? Uh, the second point, I'm talking about uh, just the idea of the universal channel. Yeah. So I'm kind of uh, thinking from the IP point of view. Yeah. We have this uh, link link technology, which we innovate, diverse, all kinds of Right. Things. Then we'll have this convergence layer. Right. Maybe it's convergence. So we, we rely on IP for the problem. So here, would that be easier to do it at the kind of access point layer to the convergence? So instead of us, each device be converging, we can have this access point acting as a kind of convergence layer device to uh, so have different device with different uh, Right. Um, that's an excellent question. Um, there was a small study done at MIT of sort of trying to build a universal wireless router that talked every wireless standard you can imagine and would allow any two devices to communicate between it. Um, I actually don't know the results of that project. I don't know if it even succeeded. Um, it's a very good question to which I just don't know the answer. You, you, you could do it in a local area. Um, in a broader area, I think it might prove a little bit challenging since a lot of these protocols are all list sitting in the unlicensed band. The question is, how do you get them to share? Um, but it might work. It might well work. I just I don't know of anybody who's pursuing that figure. It's a great idea. Another, another related question is about the handle. Yeah. Obviously, if you require the device to have uh, yep. the